Hello and welcome to the 2021 Rugby League season launch programme. My name's Kyle Walker and just like you, I've been patiently waiting for the return of Rugby League. But it's not just us who have been waiting for the return. No clubs from the Betfred Championship, League One, Women's Super League and the Community Game as well have all been waiting. But that wait is nearly over as the Betfred Challenge Cup is so close starting next Friday, March the 19th. Plus, the Women's Super League is back with us in April with Leeds, Ryan those hoping to defend their title. There's so much for us to get into, so much to talk about. And one man we're going to start that with is the chief executive of the Rugby Football League, Ralph Rimmer. Ralph, it's so good to have you here. How excited are you for the return of Rugby League? Off the scale. Um, you know, when I think back of what we've been through in the last 12-month uh, period, the, the amount of um, obstacles that we've managed to negotiate, uh, it, it's... It's incredible to be here, really. It's been a journey that has been undoubtedly painful for many, many people. Behind the scenes, lots of things have happened which nobody has seen, which is good. Um, but nevertheless, I think everybody that was involved in the 2020 season, and I'm not just talking about the, the people that played, the Super League players, for instance. Everybody played a, a really big part in it. The, um, you know, the Rugby League community does what it does. It, when, it, when it's faced with a challenge, it, it pulled itself together. And we had Super League clubs going out there week in, week out. And as I say, many things went on behind the scenes that nobody would ever see. Uh, they did some extraordinary things. But Championship and League One clubs, community clubs, they all played their part in it. Fans, spectators, uh, broadcasters as well, and uh, commercial partners. As, you know, the, Everybody chipped in, the Rugby League community pulled together to, to get us to this point. So, tough year, but really pleased to be here. It must be so exciting, but slightly nerve-wracking as well, as we get closer to the start of the season with all the obstacles that we have faced. There will be some disruption this year. That's, uh, I started last year uh, when all this came about, and I sat down at a table and I, I said there will be no perfect solutions in all this. I probably repeated it about a thousand times <laughs> over the years since then, and I've done it so, since as well. So people come to expect that. Uh, I think it's useful that they do because everyone has to get the mindset ready uh, to take on what we're about to take on. There will be uh, imperfect solutions throughout this season. Uh, it's important that we get through it. It's really important for the whole game, every element of it. The Super League certainly, but Championship of League One, community, women's, wheelchair. You know, We have a World Cup at the end of the year that we have to look forward to. So we have to help each other through and I know everyone will contribute and it's going to be a very special year. How difficult is it to plan for a season without fully knowing what lies ahead? Well, we have amassed quite a bit of knowledge uh, over last year. And I say all that, all that coming together um, uh, is going to be replicated in, into other elements of the game this year. And we, we hope that uh, everyone that supports us continues to do so. And I say that's commercial and broadcast as well. And I have to say the government were extraordinary last year as well in helping us through. So... Um, a huge kind of uh, um, movement, if you like, uh, got us to this point, and that's exactly what we've got to look at for 2021 if we're going to deliver what we know we can. Now, you did talk about it, but there is a World Cup at the end of this year, which is going to be massive for the sport. How excited are you for that? World Cups are really special. They, they bring things uh, to a country that other things don't. They bring culture, of course they do. Uh, they bring noise, they bring vibrancy, they, they bring... You know, elements that domestic competitions don't bring. And I'm not at all um, denying what domestic competitions bring. But you'll see uh, something very special at the end of the year. And in men's, women's and wheelchair rugby league as well, which makes us unique. And, we, you know, we like to be unique. We're rugby league. We are indeed. Now, it's an extremely busy season ahead and fans will finally be allowed back into stadiums as well. Just how much will that be welcomed by everyone at the RFL? Uh, well... Uh, from the RFL, absolutely, but I think you'll find the players respond to it as well, coaching staff do. Uh, I think the broadcaster did a great job portraying the game, and the players did as well last year. But really, we are a very, very passionate sport. What we want to do is stand on terraces and scream and, and get rid of everything, that all the kind of woes of the week and, and yell our team on. So I think it's hugely important for um, uh, the, the players and also for the, the fans that will stand on the terraces. I've spoken with government, as I say, they've been hugely, hugely helpful. And we've spoken about the fans coming back and the impact that will have for the World Cup and the recovery of the nation's psyche and that being a part of it. So it demonstrates how powerful it is. 
Now, in the difficult times of the last year, the rugby league community has rallied together. That has included an increase in support from key sponsors, Betfred, who were already title partners of the Men's and Women's Super League Championship and League One. And they've also added their sponsorship of the Challenge Cup. And we heard from the main man himself, Fred, in his kitchen. Fred, tell us about your sponsorship of rugby league. Well, first, let me say to you how proud I am personally and Betfred are to be part of the Rugby League family. What do I love about Rugby League? I love the people that were involved in there and the whole community spirit that they pass right through. And especially in a year that we've had with all this COVID stuff, everybody needs a lift now. And you know, this is going to be one big year for Rugby League. And I'm proud to say that we're involved in the sponsorship for the Men's Rugby League, the Women's Rugby League, and just as important for me is the Wheelchair Rugby League. It's a great game to be a part of and it's, it's just to bore you and, re and repeat the, the, uh, what I said before, I am so proud that we're involved with Rugby League. And you just added the Challenge Cup as well. Yeah, we've had the, added the Challenge Cup. It's just our expansion of it. Why have we done it? Because it's a great part of, uh, of the Betfred story. We want to be involved with community. We want to be involved in Rugby League. And we are so proud to be there. I keep saying the word proud, and that is a word that I'm going to keep using with rugby. Rugby League's bounced back with all that's going on in the world with COVID-19. And we could have the, the final of the World Cup Ultra. Well, this year is probably one of the biggest years you're ever going to get in this country for Rugby League. October, November, all the games will be played and I'm proud to say that we're at Old Trafford. I'll be there for that final. That's going to be some final. Ralph, talk to me about that partnership with Betfred. How good is it for Rugby League? Well, it has been ever since he entered. and It start, starts with Fred. Uh, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a really big character. He's very passionate. Uh, and, he, and he's, he is driven by community. I think he mentioned it on that clip there. He, he, he really believes in it. I know uh, the, the, his representation across everything we do is important to him, but going to the World Cup interest in particular, men's, women's and wheelchair, as he said, you know, it's, it's hugely important to him. And Betfred have been really proactive in pushing the women's game as well, which is another great element to the partnership. They're a, they're a sponsor that make it work hard and they're the best sponsors. So, you know, Mark and Mark, uh, and Steve, they push you every week, uh, and that's uh, that's the that's the best type of sponsor you can get. So, they're a great fit for us. It's great to hear him talk about the spirit of the game, the inclusiveness of the women's game, the wheelchair rugby as well. It's just so nice to hear someone like Fred talk about that. Absolutely, and in sponsoring the Challenge Cup, they get the men's, women's, and wheelchair Challenge Cup as well. So, uh, and that starts in the community. All of those competitions start right at community and work through to the respective finals. It's. Um, I think that element of the sponsorship really represents what Betfred are around. They are, they are, they are a, they're a community organisation and that, that pours out of, uh, of, of every part of what they do. And it should be a huge year for women's rugby as well this year, shouldn't it? Really big. They, uh, their competition starts on the 17th of April. Two new teams in there, Warrington and Huddersfield. Uh, they're going to see how tough it is. It's a very, very tough competition, so a big launch for them. Wheelchair as well. And I know I was sent a a clip of the wheelchair teams training this morning. So um, again, a big year for them and all of, all of those competitions. Obviously, those players will be hoping to select it at the end of the year in the World Cup. Ralph, it's a massive year for Rugby League this year. It's so great to have you here. So great to talk to you about it. Stay safe and hopefully I'll see you throughout the season. You will see me many times celebrating Rugby League, without a doubt. Now, one person who's especially looking forward to how big the women's game can get this year is Claire Balding. She starts her full season as the 30th president of the Rugby Football League and I caught up with her earlier. So, Claire, it's lovely to talk to you. It's lovely to have you on. It's your first full year as RFL president. What are you looking forward to most? I'm looking forward to actually going out and watching a bit more Rugby League. That would be fun. Um, it's been a very strange first year. I'm glad I've got two years in the job because there's so much I want to do that just I haven't been able to. Um, on the bright side though, I mean, gosh, I was one of the very, very few people who were privileged enough to be at Wembley for the Challenge Cup final and, and to witness such a narrow victory for Leeds Rhinos was really exciting. I mean, it was just brilliant. And then obviously Kevin Sinfield did his seven marathons in seven days in aid of MND, the MND Association, and to help support Rob Burrow and his family. And I think that cemented more than ever my 
belief that there is no other sport that it is, that is as closely connected with its local community as rugby league. So I think as a broader fan base and family, I actually think this year has been huge for rugby league, but as a sport, it needs to regenerate and we get that chance with, with everything starting again. So I'm very excited about the growth and the potential of, of women's rugby league and, and obviously the women's super league coming back and that's had an 18 month break. We all know that women's sports generally through the pandemic has suffered much more than men's sport, and I think I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing that back again, um, and obviously building up to the World Cup in the autumn, and and the opportunity there, particularly I think for the women's game, to cement its place in in people's consciousness, and therefore give more girls the chance and the idea of playing rugby league. Well, exactly. And looking ahead to that Rugby League World Cup, it is this year. It's going to be a massive year for the sport. How important is the fact that the men's game, the women's game and wheelchair rugby, it's all together? It's groundbreaking. And it's the first time that a weekend, I mean, it's the first time all three obviously have been concurrent, concurrently run in any sport. But on the weekend of the finals, the wheelchair final will be on the Friday evening, I think it is. And then the Saturday afternoon, the men's and women's finals follow each other. That is immense. And that's such an important statement as well as a great showcase. So I'm very excited about that. And I know that as far as England are concerned, the women are going out to win. I mean, there's, there's you know, getting to a final and performing well is, is not an option. They want to win. They want to lift that trophy. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited. I also think for a broader public ticket sales have been so strong and particularly across people who've never been to rugby league before and the variety of different postcodes from where those people have come is great because it proves that rugby league when you do spread it outside its traditional m62 corridor northern stronghold it still has an appeal in fact it has a real novelty factor because so many people have never seen top class rugby league and having games in london and coventry and various other areas um, I think it, it, that's very important, that that gives everyone a chance and it gives Rugby League a chance to broaden its fan base. So I, I'm really excited about that. How good is it then that fans from all over the UK will get to see Rugby League as well? Do you think it will help the growth of the sport across the UK? Massively. There, there is no doubt, you know, this going right back to when Rugby League turned professional and, and broke away from Rugby Union, there was a real concentration on how do we make this an entertaining sport? How do we give people their money's worth? These are hardworking folk spending quite a large percentage of their income on a ticket to watch a match for players who are paid. So the drive behind Rugby League has always been to be entertaining. And I think those who've never watched it before will be surprised at always how good it is. You know, that you get a level, the standard is extraordinary. I think the commitment to the players is, is complete and total. You don't get boring, dull games of rugby league where they just punt it from one end to the other or like a football equivalent, a goalless draw. It doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. The game isn't designed that way. So the, I think that's what, that's what excites me, the chance for people to realise that and understand it. And I hope within the club game, find a side that they care about start to watch them, start to get to know the players, follow them through thick and thin. And that's how you build a long-term commitment. It's easier with international rugby because, you, you know, it doesn't matter where you live in the country. If you're English, you will support England. If you're Scottish, you will support Scotland and so on. Um, that's sort of an easier sell. It's, it's the broader club game that I would also love to see grow. And I think there's a real chance there to build on what the World Cup will bring us. Everyone's desperate for a shared experience. We're all desperate to actually be part of a crowd again. And the Rugby League World Cup gives us that opportunity. Now, it's also been confirmed that the Women's Super League is coming back in April. How important is this season after the 2020 season was suspended? It's huge. It's really important. I think for the players themselves to know that there is a point to all of that training is, is really important. And I know from the work I do in other sports and let's say for the Olympics, how difficult it is for players not to have a target, not to have a reason for what they're doing. And it's okay in the high paid professional sports where you get the money, whether actually you play or not. It's not okay in those sports where 
you're scraping together a living, um, you're probably doing another job, almost certainly, and most of the women are, a lot of them are working within roles that are key worker roles. You know, they've been really under pressure through the pandemic. Rugby league is their release. And I believe that women's sport and women's rugby league in this specific case only can only flourish when it has the respect of the masses and the rewards um, that allow people not to have to, you know, buy their own kit, um, replace their own boots, pay for their own training sessions and gym membership. It's simple things like that. And, and Women's Super League need, needs to grow. And, and this is a great chance to almost start again. And, and I, I want the players to know how much they are valued. And that can only happen when you've got a meaningful competition to aim at. And you've got, you know, obviously for a lot of them, the goal is to then get on the, the, the national side. Um, and we've got an Origins game coming back as well to help give those top level players that, that type of experience. Um, and also to give the coach a chance to make the best selection. So I, it's crucial. It's absolutely crucial for the game as it is right now, but also for the future of, of women's rugby league. Real 2021 is going to be a huge year for the sport. And thank you so much for joining us and thank you for talking to us. You're welcome. Thank you, Carl. It was great chatting to Claire there. It is going to be an exciting 2021 for Rugby League. Now, joining me to talk all things Rugby League as well is the Daily Mirror's Rugby League correspondent, Gareth Walker, and also Leeds Rhinos player, Danica Prim. Danica, I need to start with you, all right, because it's a massive year. The R Women's Super League is back after 18 months, 18 long months off as well. How yeah. excited are you for that? Sounds crazy when you say it like that. But yeah, it's been such a long time coming and we are ridiculously excited to be back and to have a date now, finally. Um, makes it all a bit more real because there's lots of, you know, over the years, we, the year we've heard possibly this date, possibly that date, but we've got a definitive date now. We've got a start time, we've got fixtures so yeah, the hard work continues or begins, I'm not quite sure. Honestly, I've been working hard in lockdown, um, but yeah, back to it now with the girls. You know, we've, we've started training together again um, and the excitement is mega. It's, it's, it's just massive, you know, the, the end is in sight or the, the start is there, who knows, but yeah, cannot wait. Now, I know the first training session will have been fun. How did it feel after that first session? <laughs> I mean, it's a bit, bit rocky this morning. Uh, we, we met last night and uh, for the first time and we were out there for quite a while in the gym as well with each other. So we were definitely put through our paces. Everyone loves a fitness test. You know, pre-season fitness test. <laughs> Tick. Yeah. Past it. Um, but yeah, it was wicked. Uh, a bit sore, but uh, raring, raring to go. And Gareth, how exciting is it for the women's game to be back finally, just for rugby league in general? Yeah, definitely. I mean, 2020 was a difficult year for lots of levels of rugby league, wasn't it? But I think it was a particular shame for the women's game that they had to shut down just at a stage where it seemed they were on a cusp of kind of going on to the next level, you know, the association with Super League clubs, uh, sponsors like Betfred getting on board. And I think from a media point of view, there was a, a greater appreciation of, of the importance and quality of the game as well. So hopefully they can get back on, on that kind of wave of, of where they were moving to and, and it'll be good for everyone in the sport. And Danica, you've juggled so much as well with also being a teacher. How has that been? <laughs> it's all part and parcel of the game, isn't it? Um, everyone's a student or employed or, or however it might be. So I think with last season and the, the pandemic and things like that, it, it has been hard to juggle, like where's the fine line between working and playing and not having that elite status. But now we know we can, we can play. But yeah, it, I'm a teacher. It's been interesting. It's been fun. Uh, it's been a challenge, but you live and learn and you build from that. So uh, it's, it's, it's been a learning curve, but it's been, it's manageable and we've done it. We're, we're seeing the end now. Honestly, well done from me because it's incredible to see all the hard work that's gone in behind the scenes as well. And I'm just excited for Women's Super League to be back on yeah. that front as well. Now, it is exciting for Rugby League this year. Let's talk a little bit about the championship, Gareth, because a very competitive season hopefully lies ahead. Yeah, absolutely. If you look at um, the teams involved, I think you could easily say eight or ten teams would be pushing for that top six playoff. A, a big influx of high quality players into the competition from Super League. You've got some really big star names coming down there into several different teams, not just one or two. And I think it's a really ex exciting time for the sport at that level. Danica, it does feel like it's getting more and more competitive, not just within the Super League, but Championship, League One as well. It feels like it's competitive across the board. Yeah, with the movement, you know, with Newcastle coming up, you've got York have recruited ridiculously well. You <laughs> know, um, I can't wait to see how they're going to they're gonna fare because the experience alone in that squad, you know, whether they are... Um, coming to the end of the careers and like their experience alone will be great for York. Um, so it's great to see, like, and like Gareth said, 
the competition for that championship is just going to be insane. I don't think you can call it yet, can you? But you know, it's going to be um, it's going to be entertaining. Definitely. Entertaining indeed. <laughs> now it is a huge year for everyone involved in the RFL, including all of our championship teams. As Danica mentioned, there Newcastle Thunder won the race to be the championship's 14th spot for this season. And for Dennis Betts, who is taking the job as a director of rugby, he's so excited about the potential for the game in the northeast. It's a question not of expectations but of aspirations. Okay, Dennis. So. Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the start of the season. I'm looking forward to getting my gloves off, taking a hat off, getting a bit of stewed, getting some um, warm weather and watching rugby again. It's been a, been a long time coming and being part of the championship has um, it made it even more exciting for this year. What's the expectations of the championship? What, what, uh, what do you expect? We don't really. I know this is going to sound quite contrary. We haven't got any expectations. We've got aspirations. So we're, we just we want to be the best team we can be. We've recruited quite well, I feel, and we've, we're excited by what's to come. Linking into that, you've, as you see, you've recruited quite well. Who's uh, stood out in terms of who should the fans be looking oh, I'm for? Looking, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of players. Evan Hodgson's been really excited. He's, he's full life and young front roller that wants to come and play. Um, I'm not a new signing, but somebody we haven't really seen fully yet, and that's Matty Wright. I'm looking forward to getting um, getting him in the championship and him showing how good a player he can be. And obviously the, the classic but, um, good halfback pairing that we've, we've changed our halfbacks this year. And we've, we've brought in Josh Woods and um, Jake Shorrox, and I'm looking forward to seeing how they they combined. I think you said sort of in the in the off season when you when the signs were being announced, it was important that uh, there were players who bought into what Thunder's about, and what they're trying to achieve here. So how have you seen that translate in, into how they've been training? They've trained well. I, I won't expect anything less. They've not. They've not been around it for about a year, a lot of these boys, and it's like it's just exciting for them to get back into into training and playing playing games and looking forward to what what's some kind of normality to them, and that's playing rugby. It's not just the playing staff where there's been uh, new additions. We've fashioned Eamon O'Carroll as the as the new head coach. So what's uh, what's he been like, and how's he settled into life here? Well, I've got to say nice things, haven't I? Really, it's, I, I, I recruited the man. It's, he's a He's got loads of enthusiasm, he's a fantastic coach. And like I say, I've been really impressed with how he's gone away and learnt his trade. And like I say, he's spent a couple of years in a really tough coaching environment. He's worked with Steve McNamara over it. And being in a different environment, being in France and having to cope with language difficulties and, and also being a new, new, new young coach has uh, made, his, made his work even that little bit tougher. And I think he's adapted to that and, he's, and we're going to get fantastic care. Um, Aspiring coach this year. The championship season kicks off uh, at home to a, a side that you obviously both know well, and if you're the lads know well and witness, how excited are you that the, the, the fixture computers drawn that up as the first game in the championship? I know what it gets. I, I'm obviously it's just that's the way it is. The championship. It's great that we're, we're playing witness, but it's been long. It feels like a long time now since I was involved with witness. Lots of things have changed. I'm excited for Simon and Simon to do well there. I've got lots of friends in witness, but I'm. Yeah, we're about this year. I'm, I'm excited for the championship. I'm excited for the quality of teams that we're going to be able to play. The teams like Witness, the Bradfords, the Featherstones, the Toulouse. To go to those places and have a, have a real crack. You mentioned the aspirations to, to be the best team that we can be. It's also a big year, for, a big year for the sport in the region. So how much do your aspirations fit into to the wider picture, I guess? Well, just rugby league in this area. It's, it's, it's a... It's, it's really growing. There's a there's a massive push in the community. There's a real growth in the community. There's lots of kids playing rugby league in this part of the world, and to give them something like say to look up to is something that this group have been really keen to do. Now, Dennis mentioned early on that they don't have any expectations for this season, but they have recruited well. Gareth, do you think they could do well this season? There's certainly the potential there, and you know I think it's important that Dennis talks about the the work that they've done in a local area as well. You know, there's been some huge growth in the amateur and junior get, uh, games in Newcastle. Uh, but it's what happens on the field that will matter this year. Um, he mentioned the half-back pairing of Shorrocks and Woods. That's really exciting. A young coach in Eamon O'Carroll. Uh, the main man for me is, is the captain and hooker, Bob Beswick. He knows all about what it, what it takes to, to achieve at this level and be at the top end of the championship. It's going to be tough for them because this is a tough league and there genuinely are no easy games. But Bob Beswick will, uh, will be crucial to how they go, I think. 
Now, Danica, how difficult do you think it is coming up into the championship, but also as a team, just getting back into training, getting ready, preparing for that first game? Well, that's it, isn't it? It's a double thing, isn't it? You've got to get ready for, for playing again. It's been such a long time since they've been out. It goes down to things like your game day routine, your prep. That's the first thing that they're going to... That's the first hurdle to get back into the swing of things. But secondly, like Dennis mentioned, it's, it's an aspirational thing. You know, they're up there now. They're not going to set their targets too high. They're going to see how they fare. They fare. And it is, I think, probably one of the toughest championships that we've had in a long time in terms of the, the potentially could be a, a split between you know, the bottom and the top half of the league. Um, and he's mentioned a few games that he wants to go and, and test the, the team out on. And then that's, that's much more realistic than saying, <laughs> we're going in, we're going to go fighting. You know, they're stepping up. They're, they're being realistic about it. They're going to aspire to stay in there at least and, and to you know, compete against some of the teams that he's mentioned. But go and try it out and see how it happens. You know, it, it, like, you know, the growth of the game in Newcastle is great at the minute. Having the Magic Weekend up there, you know, it's only going to develop the sport even more. So as long as they can keep putting on a good show and, and keep attracting you know, spectators, which therefore is going to attract more to the game, it'll be great. Gareth, how big of a step up is it for them into the Championship? You know, that shouldn't be underestimated. They certainly have assembled a quality squad, um, but clubs have, have come up with quality squads before and found it difficult because, I mean, that old cliche of there being no easy games, you go right down through the division. There's such a wide variety of challenges in the championship, sizes of pitch, you know, kinds of pitches that you play on, full-time squads, part-time squads. You know, every week you've got a different challenge and Newcastle will have to adapt to that, but they've certainly got some great personnel to take that challenge on. On our tour of the Championship Clubs, the next stop was York and Lewis Smith of Betfred went to speak to Knights head coach James Ford as well as Chief Executive John Flatman in their brand new home. It's fantastic, it's brilliant for the club, it's brilliant for the sport and it's brilliant for, for the people of York. I just think it's a real inspirational place for the, for the team to continue the progress and the training facility is a first class. It's given everybody on the field and off the field a real boost. It's given us a, a commercial boost and it's a real opportunity to kick on and, and not have that stadium as a barrier to the next level. It's been a process for me for four years. I think it's been a process for others for a lot longer and we've had some ups and some downs as most construction projects have. Um, but ultimately once we got, you know, to that position where we could move our stuff and it was um, it was relief and it was excitement. Once the relief had subsided, it was, well, right, let's get on with it. There's, you know, nothing that's holding us back anymore. Let's roll up our sleeves. Let's show the world. You know, the players and I, have, we've, we've got no excuses. We've got uh, great infrastructure around us and uh, combine that to the attitude the boys have got. You know, I, you know, I think we're in a real good, good spot. The issues of the past are now are now parked up and we must look forward to the future and I think uh, when you look at the two combined investments by the council and, and the university and, and and the private sector as well you're talking upwards of 60 million pounds in, in the training centre uh, and here there's, there's very little we now can't achieve because of the facilities and if that next step is Super League then that's what we're trying to do on the field. I just think the, perfect, the, the potential of the club is enormous if coached right and there's some pressure on me there it, it can continue growing and become a good Super League club. You look at the wealth of the area, the facilities we've got, you know, the uh, how the how the public is starting to get behind this, and how the perception of York outside of York is growing. I just think, you know, in, in three or four years' time, could this team be competing? At, could this club be competing at the top of Super League? I, I believe so. We think we've now got a training facility that is not a barrier to any next level. Um, we've got some. You know, the vast majority of the, the, the performance staff and the personnel are in the position where they're ready to go to the next level. Within that, there's a blend of youth and experience, and I think we've got a culture that is, a, is about success, but sustainable success. So, you know, from James's uh, uh, level of ambition and expectation, you know, all of those e ingredients are there, and it's for that group to come together the best they can to, to make match days very special for everybody. Having spoke to a couple of the supporters uh, via Zoom, etc., the the desperate to be back here uh, or to be here and watch and watch the team play, and just like the players are, the players are absolutely keen as much to get out on that field and play, and even more so when they get some supporters in to cheer them on. I think it will be a feeling of excitement. There's a game about to occur with fans in. I think there'll be um, a little bit of sadness for those who aren't here, uh, but I think an exciting time. I love rugby league and. You know, uh, it would be great to, to coach a game here and I'm sure the players are looking forward to it and even more so the supporters.
Gareth, we have to start with the LNER Community Stadium. Massive season for them. New home as well. It's going to kick life into them, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It looks fantastic, doesn't it? And uh, James Ford and John Flatman are just two such impressive individuals when they talk about both the club and the team and the sustainable growth. You know, they've got two guys in charge there that are going to lead them forward. You know, they were a club that applied for Super League, remember, so they've made clear what the long-term ambitions are. And with some of the names that they've recruited this year, you know, a string of Super League additions, Ben Jones, Bishop, Ryan Atkins, Danny Kermond, Adam Cuthbertson. You know, it's an exciting time on and off the field for York City Knights. Really interested to see how they go this year. They've talked about the investment in the club, the long-term plans for them as well. Is this what the club needed, Gareth? Yeah, well, that's what they needed for the next stage. You know, I went to Bootham Crescent a couple of times when, you know, Flatman and Ford were leading this kind of, of revival of the club, really, from when they took over. Um, and for all its characteristics, and it had a great atmosphere there, I think everybody knew they needed something a bit more if they wanted to move on to the next level. Looking around the, the pictures of the stadium, it look, looks sensational, doesn't it? So really exciting times for the club. Danica, it does feel like it's a big long-term project. How will that impact players and staff knowing that the club are investing in the future? Well, they've set the precedent, haven't they? That stadium is incredible. It makes you feel more valued. It makes you feel more professional. Um, so I think as the players going forward now, they're going to have more purpose, just in the sense that this is a serious kind of, of project, may it be. Um, but yet, you know, they've got some great names in there. And for the, for the names that they've got to to buy into what the club are, have got on board, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a sales pitch to each player they've recruited saying this is our long-term goal. That long-term goal has got to be good enough to, to have the names that they've got and, and to set the standard and to... Their goals are big, their goals are very clear, um, but you know, confidence is key, isn't it? And that's what they've got, uh, and Fordy's great, and he's, he's confident in the sense that he can say that that club will go and compete at the top end of Super League, so uh, you know, I really hope for them that it, it happens, and I think that's one team in the Championship that I'm really going to be behind, maybe secretly, but <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've, got my, uh, they've got my vote for sure, so uh, yeah, I really hope they, they push forward. Now, York also have a women's team, and the new stadium will be a key venue in the Women's World Cup. Another example of the growing strength as a club? Yeah, wicked, what a place to have it, you know, and to have the Kiwis there, you know, who are going to be fighting for that trophy, um, and always have done against, against the Aussies as well, so, you know, it's a great stadium, it, not only is it a great house for the Kiwis, and I think whoever's going to play up there as well, but... For spectators, it sets the uh, the standard for the women's game. You know, we've we've played in many a community venue, and we're always grateful to get to play wherever we can do. But to have venues like York up there and in the in the World Cup venue list is just incredible, and it really helps to move our game forward and make it look more professional as well. And Gareth, we have to highlight the first game of the season, the Betfred Challenge Cup. York City Knights, they're included. Yeah, absolutely. It's an intriguing class with Sheffield, isn't it? Really, because if York are kind of the new kids on the block almost in terms of the championship. Sheffield are the old stages, they've been there a long time, won it a couple of times under Mark Aston. And there's a real contrast in the recruitment. You know, we've seen York sign a lot of these Super League names. Sheffield have gone for a younger player, Mark Aston, regularly talks about projects and developing young players. So a fascinating first clash for the whole season to kick off. It is indeed. Now, earlier on, I was joined by Featherstone Rovers coach James Webster. Last season was his first one in charge and just as he got going, that was when COVID struck. James, it's good to see you. We've got to start with a big question. How excited are you to get back into things? You must be desperate to get going again. Yeah, really excited. Um, it was fantastic. We got our first taste of competitive rugby again on the weekend against Oldham. And um, we'll back that up again uh, this week uh, against uh, Batley. And all a fresh rehearsal for what will be a massive uh, uh, Challenge Cup game against uh, the Bradford Bulls. Now, it must be a lot of expectations on you guys. You're strong favourites for promotion right there. How do you deal with that expectation? Um, you know, I wouldn't say we're favourites. Then Toulouse, Toulouse would have to be favourites to win the competition. Um, you know, they're full-time. But in saying that, um, I would say it's a, it's a, good, it's a good feeling. You know, we're, we're confident in the team we have. Uh, we think we've got a really good squad. Um, competition for places is exceptionally strong this year and uh, I feel that we've had a good and productive uh, pre-season in what's been difficult circumstances. Just how difficult have those circumstances been because the whole world has been affected by this. We know that Rugby League has been affected by everything that's going on as well. But for you guys, how difficult has that been? Yeah, it's just been different. Um, Rugby League players really enjoy um, you know, structure and understanding what they're going to do and where they're going to be. Um, the length of time it takes to get 
you know, anywhere close to the normal amount of training you do uh, is amazing. You know, we've been there for a lot longer than normal. And when that's the people that work during the day turning up at night, you know, that can be difficult. And you know, how many people can have a gym and where you can be at what certain time, what equipment you can use, where and when. Um, logistically, it's been difficult, but, you know, we've embraced it. And I think we've come through the other side pretty well. Is that something that you have found this season that everyone's had to be flexible, everyone's had to adapt to the current situation and you guys have come together as a team? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, personally, I was lucky that I, I had a chance to participate you know, with League and Super League last year. So I, I understood roughly the, the time elements and the logistical problems that this COVID situation creates for training and, and for rugby league in general. Um, you know, at first we didn't have a lot to spend a lot of time as a team because we we're basically training in and out, you know, getting in and getting it done and getting out as quick as we can in small groups. But that's changed a little bit in the last fortnight, I'd say. And uh, I think the boys really enjoyed playing as a team on the weekend, the first time seeing a different team and getting out there and, you know, feel it. It probably felt like the first time this year that, you know, we're, we're actually a team. And um, I look forward to continuing that. How competitive do you think the championship is going to be this season? Yeah, I think it's been it's been well said many times already. Um, you know, there is a you know oversupply of fantastic clubs you know, chasing one dream this year. Um, yeah, I think every club has recruited well. You have Toulouse and London as full time clubs um, that have you know the buying power and you know, the ability to train full time. I think York, a uh, club on the up, has done well. Um, in their recruitment, um, you have asked about Halifax. Um, Bradford has recruited well as well, um, with some, some players out of uh, Super League. Um, you know, Woodness, you know, every single club, in my opinion, has recruited um, some really good players. So it's going to be a tough, tough competition. Well, amazing. Good luck for this season, and hopefully, we'll get to see you soon. Thanks, anytime. The wonders of Zoom right there. I can be here in the studio talking to him from the comfort of his living room right there. Gareth, let's talk about Featherstone's season. What do you expect for them? Well, Betfred have them right up there, don't they, in terms of the championship favourites, and I think that's that's justifiable. Uh, we've talked about big-name signings at Featherstone. You've got you know Chris Wellham, Craig Kopzak, Junior Moores. You know, these are not fringe Super League players. These are established top-flight players who played all the careers more or less at the top level. Uh, and I think that's why Featherston is seen by many people as possibly the strongest side as the season starts. Right, it's time to get back on the road. And the next stop is Witness, who are hoping to improve on last season. We chatted to Vikings' Matty Smith, who seems to be enjoying working with his new Witness coach, Simon Finnegan. So, Matty, how have you and the club coped throughout the pandemic? And how good is it to finally have some rugby league? look forward to it at the last yeah obviously it's been um, you know it's been a difficult time you know not just for our club but for, for everyone you know involved in, in sport and uh, and life in general you know it's um, you know we've had three lockdowns now and um, you know carrying on training you know on your own especially when you've been in a, a team environment for such a long time um, you know has been difficult you know I've been obviously playing the game for 14 years and I've, I've been used to kind of that coming in around the lads, that camaraderie and, um, you know, not to have that and to try and motivate yourself and train on your own, it's been, it's been hard, but, uh, you know, just great to be back now. Um, you know, we've had a good pre-season so far and, you know, we're all looking forward to the start of the year. Obviously, Simon Finnegan's come in as head coach during the off-season. What's it been like working with him and, and what's he brought to the club so far? Yeah, he's been, he's been really good, um, you know, really approachable coach, um, you know, someone you can, you can easily go and talk to and, and and get advice from and, and, and he's come in and, and really you know uplifted things I think you know training's been, been been really good really enjoyable you know he's made the sessions you know different and um, you know we've been working a lot more on, on defence as well and I think that's what's going to you know set us in good stead this year you know our attack was great last year but you know there's parts we can improve in that but I think the defensive uh, you know the, the defensive systems and all that um, is, is what we're going to have to improve if we want to finish where we want to finish and, and Simon's come in and done that so um, yeah really really enjoying working with him and, and, he, and he's had a great impact. Obviously some changes in the off season in the, in the playing personnel as well experienced players such as Paul Clough and Steve Tyler and Lee Jewett yeah. have come in what what have those those kind of players what have they brought to the squad? I think like you say you know experience um, you know it's massive um, not only for 
um, you know, a Super League, but but obviously we're in the Championship now, and and I thought, you know, that's what we was probably lacking a little bit last year, and you know, it's it's helped me out certainly, you know, in, in my position as halfback and someone who, who kind of, you know, gets the team around the park to have them, you know, them middles like you just mentioned, Cookie, Cluffy, and um, you know, people like that, you know, to help you in the middle there is um, is massive for for myself and for the team, so. Um, yeah, the experience they're going to bring. Uh, I think they've played a lot of Super League games between them, and uh, it's only going to help us, you know, this year. It's a very strong competition this season, the Championship. A lot of strong teams in the. What do you think that this team's capable of achieving in 2021? Yeah, you know, I experienced I mean, only six games last year, but you know, I seen the intensity of it, and um, you know, London came here, gives a really good game, and, and that's when it really hit me that it was it was a great competition, and, and you know, it was going to be a difficult competition, but. Uh, you know the people that we've signed. You know Simon coming in. Uh, I think we're in an even stronger position this year. So um, you know I'm hoping for big things from us this year. You know we've got a great balance in the squad with the, the young lads and, and the, the like you just mentioned the older lads, the senior lads. Um, so you know we can we can achieve wherever we want to. But you know the hard work starts here. We, we've got to we've got to keep improving in off season and, and pre season and, and hopefully we can get off to a good start and, and, and really put our first you know foot forward. You're one of the more experienced players in, in the team, obviously playing in Super League yourself as well. Has your role changed within the group with, with some of the young lads and, and helping them out? Yeah, I think I've always I've always kind of been that kind of person anyway. You know, I, I like to think of myself as being approachable for the young guys to, you know, to come and, and ask if they need any advice or anything. But I, t I tend to do that anyway, you know, being an halfback, I'm always talking, I'm always, uh, I think you've seen me out here, I never, I never really shut up. So it's. Um, you know, but that's a, it's a big part of my kind of you know moving forward now. You know, I want to become hopefully a coach myself. Um, you know, when I finish playing, and, and if I can help some of them young lads as well as the older lads, um, then, I'm, then I'm you know I'm happy to do that because we you know we've got some great young lads here who who do want to learn and want to get better. Danica, an interesting point Matty made was how hard it was training when you're so used to the team environment. How difficult can that be? Oh, I think it's been one of the hardest challenges we've had. Uh, motivation, just, you know, one minute you sat on the sofa, you know, you locked down, you're watching TV, you know you've got to go do a session. And it's <laughs> kind of like, when you're not feeling it sometimes that you go into a team session, you're going to go there, you're going to get, you know, chatting with your team, you're going to get motivated by them. But to do it on your own is has been really difficult. So I, you know, hold my hands up to anybody because last season we could have been gone at any time. So you had to be prepared, you know, and, and, and at the drop of a hat, to be fair. Um, so yeah, really difficult, and it, it's nice to have some kind of of plan and in place now as to when we're all going to start. So we're back to it, and we don't have to worry about that too much now. <laughs> and Gareth, new head coach Simon Finnegan, he seems to have uplifted team spirits. We saw what Matty said right there. Has he come in and done that? Yeah, it certainly looks like it, doesn't it? I mean, I think it's fair to say it was a bit of a shock when Tim Sheen's left them. Um, but Simon Finnegan's been talked about as a highly rated coach for a long time now. Uh, and listening to Matty Smith there, it seems like he's having that impact. And, you know, we've talked about quality players again. If you've got Matty Smith at Scrum Half and Logan Tompkins at Hooker, guys that have played in top level finals. And then, you know, your Danny Cravens, uh, your Matt Cooks and Paul Cluffs in that squad as well. Uh, Widness certainly shouldn't be overlooked. How can a new coach spare on a team, Danica? It just brings in a new little piece of the recipe doesn't it so um, to have, have somebody in you that maybe you've not worked with before maybe you don't know how they work as well you have to switch back on because not only do you need to switch on to how they work but you also want to make an impression you know they've, they've been watched they've been seen playing again but in that in training environment where it, it's not as as visible for everybody else to see you need to step up and, and work under there adapt to them work for them and work to basically earn a shirt and earn your place in the squad as well so I think it kind of gives that kind of you know, a little bit of extra that you might need, especially coming out of a lockdown as well. Now, Witness do take on West Wales Raiders in their Challenge Cup game. Tough start to the season, Gareth? It's an interesting one, isn't it? Media-wise, that's going to get some attention there. If <laughs> potentially got Gavin Henson and Randy Chase <laughs> playing at half-back alongside each other. Uh, so what a great cup tie that is. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see how West Wales go. They're a very ambitious club. Tough, tough match for them to come up against that strong Witness side. But I think there'll be all eyes on, on Chase and Henson to see how they go on. Yeah. Matty did talk about his role in the team and how naturally he's helping some of the younger players as well. How much, how much value is that experience in a team, do you think, Danica? Oh, it's huge, it's mega. It doesn't matter about your age or, or whatever. It's just, you know, that experience and being around the environment. Um, I know, for me, I'm quite new to rugby league in the sense of only been in it five years. So I've called upon girls younger than me who have been in the environment, who've been into World Cups, who've been on tours again. Um, and it just helps. It's that kind of the go-to, isn't it? Because if you go to your coach all the time, 
maybe you don't want to look like you're not sure what's going on, but you go to a friend or a teammate. Uh, and it's that kind of superficial arm around the shoulder in a in more of a supportive way. Um, but yeah, and, and I think you can pick up on the young ones now. We've got a load of young girls coming through and it's kind of that, just, yeah, keep going, put your head up, you know, you, you do something wrong and you've got to make sure that it's, it's not a problem. Things do happen. It's just how you pick yourself up and use your team to, to carry yourself through. So it's it's mega important, especially someone who's coming to the end of their career and that, and you know, and that's kind of the lasting legacy they might leave is, is how supportive and helpful they were. From Widnes to Toulouse, after years at Catalan's Dragons, Remy Casti looks ahead to his first season with the French Championship side, Toulouse Olympique. So Remy, what was it like uh, to leave Catalan's Dragons after, after so long with the club? Has it felt strange preparing for a season with a new club? Uh, yeah, firstly, it's a bit. Uh, uh, I'm, I was uh, a bit uh, disappointing to uh, the way that, that happened with Catalan, but yeah, uh, in the life, it's, it's a life, and you have to bounce back and and find a, a new uh, project, a new uh, a new goal, and. Um, and uh, it's, it's why I came to to Toulouse and uh, to prepare with them is yeah it's like a refresh uh, and uh, it's very uh, enthusiastic and uh, to to be with a new a new face and yeah it's, it's pr pretty good. What made you choose to move to Toulouse Olympic? They show me they want me uh, straight away and and. They, we, and they made effort to, to have me in, uh, in the squad uh, and also uh, I can see um, when I visit them before to sign I saw a professional team they are ready they are ready to to go up in Super League they want they want it and they show me how they can achieve this, this project and and that suit with my my ambition and my willingness to 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 be in a in a good team. As you moved in a new house, to you to you a new house. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I yeah, just <laughs> few uh, la just last week I uh, I moved in in, in, um, in a little town. Uh, name is Saint Jean, and uh, all all. Um, with all my family, uh, wife, kids, fa my daughter, all and and also dog. Everything, uh, everything uh, changed, and uh, I think uh, it's uh, very important for for me to be uh, to l to live where where you play and to embrace uh, uh, um, the. It's a new new style of culture too. Uh, to in the fourth uh, biggest city in uh, in France, so you have to to be part of that. What do you expect from the championship? I know the championship now because there is um, there is one team promoted. You 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 expect to have a Super League play, uh, player in uh, in in uh, each team who wants to go in Super League. So the level is is I think is highest. So you can can see that uh, when we play the. Uh, play down in 2017 with Catalan. You can see the, there is a competitive uh, team, tough team. Yeah, we we know it's yeah. So it will be uh, every game uh, in, uh, in uh, especially in, in England. It will be a uh, will will be hard. Have you worked with Sylvain Oules before? Uh, no work. Play play with him. Play with him in French, French team. So yeah, he's he's yeah he's, and I uh, I know. Uh, I talked with him uh, before a uh, few few years and ago, and yeah, I know his style uh, of footy, and yeah, I think he's he's a very very good coach and we good the philosophy, and yeah, I'm very pleased to to work with him. Now, Danica, one of the interesting points he made there was his reasons for joining Toulouse, and he said that the club showed that they wanted him straight away. Does that make a player just want to be part of the club? You feel valued, don't you? Who doesn't want to be involved when you feel valued? And, you know, they're going to get set him out a clear role, like, we want you for this reason and this purpose, and that's going to be your role within the club. So he's got, he's got reason, he's got value, he's got purpose. Um, you know, everything that you want when 
maybe your exit from your previous club wasn't as expected. So, yeah, it's given him given a little bit more drive, I, I will assume. Um, and he knows exactly what they want from him. And they're another club with great aspirations, you know, to, to move up and to move into the Super League as soon as they can do. So it's, you know, a club driving forward that really wants somebody to do a job for them. So I would think it's a, a real key, key selling point. And Gareth, he did say that. He mentioned from what he's seen, he believes they can get into the Super League. Do you agree? Well, they've certainly got the potential. I think if we're talking about recruitment, you look just in their forwards, they've signed Remy Caster, uh, Eloy Pellissier, Mitch Garbett, Andrew Dixon, Joseph Paolo, Don Peru. You know, again, these are Super League players. They've always been exciting to watch Toulouse, always had fast, quick backs and play a great brand of rugby under Sylvan Hules. Uh, if you look at that pack of forwards now, they seem to have all the ingredients to take that next step that they want to. And how good would it be to have another French side in the Super League at some point? I think it'd be fantastic, you know, that to have that rival with Catalans would add another dimension uh, to Super League. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of clubs vying for that position and each one will think they've got their own uh, credentials for it. But for French Rugby League to grow, it'd be terrific on that front. It'd be great for the sport as well, wouldn't it, Danica, to see another French yeah. side there. And also, as we're talking about, the sport just to keep growing and growing. Yeah, whether it's Newcastle, whether it's South of France, you know, spreading the wings and, and you know getting some good quality clubs. It's not just about having rugby there, but it's having good quality, you know, competitive rugby. So it'll be great. Back to the UK now, and this time we stopped in the capital and spoke to Sadiq Sid Adebayi, one of the young Londoners who's come through under Danny Ward. He's been chatting to Adam Whiteside from the RFL. So, Sid, you signed a new deal with London in the off-season. What made you stay at the club for 2021? Um, staying at London was, without a doubt, uh, an option that I was going to take. It was it's my hometown club. I've come through the system. Um, like Wardy and and Langers have like built built me up throughout the throughout my youth system. So uh, the amount of trust they put in me, put trust in them. So staying is well dealt. Um, out of the question. And uh, you mentioned being your hometown club. There, obviously, London isn't isn't in the heartlands for rugby league. How did you get into rugby league? Give us a bit of background into your story and how you got into it. Um, mine's a bit weird actually. So I was actually living up in Warrington, and then um, I start basically I was like every other kid wanting to play football, and then um, started playing rugby league for school, and then we moved down to London, and then I was like, oh, I love I love rugby league. I need to find like a place to play rugby league, and then went down to Staines Titans, which is now Richmond Warriors. Um, my junior league club started playing there. I knew the head coach because he coached me at rugby union as well. So I started playing there, um, and then started getting scouted for some of the London pathways, like Origin, North East South. Um, went to a couple of trials, then got into the scholarship system and the academy, and so forth. Brilliant. And what school was that in Warrington that you played for originally? Um, Cardinal Newman, so there's, there's quite a few players. So like Harvey Levet was in the same same year as me. Um, I think Andre Sevilla went to that school as well. So there's was, was a fair few of us that played rugby league. Good, good. And um, you touched on um, kind of the pathways in London, how you come through and into the system at the Broncos. I guess there's more London players, London based players in in the London squad than ever. How good is it that you've got that? core of London is in there and how important is it for the growth of the game in the capital? I think it's absolutely class. I mean, I remember like growing up and seeing loads of the kids um, look up to players in the first team and not so much not knowing who they are, but like from different places, from the north, from Australia, you couldn't really picture yourself being there. But now that there's a lot of young players coming through, it just shows what sort of talent is in London. And um, like a lot of us play together in the academy, so a lot of us know the systems. A lot of us can easily bed in together. Like we've got four of us living in the same house, so it just shows how much talent there is in London. And like like you said, the amount of players that come through the system now that are in the first team just shows how far the game can go down south. Brilliant. And you you featured for London in in the Super League in two thousand nineteen. Um, the the hope this year in the air must be trying to get promotion and return to the to the top flight. Yeah, a hundred percent. Got a taste of Super League, and I thought we went quite well. Just unlucky to 
get relegated. Um, myself, it was probably a dream come true to play Super League and to play Super League with a club that you come through as well. And um, yeah, that year was something special to get promoted as well. I think we were not favourites to get promoted as well and kept like a, a core team members together, played Super League together. And yeah, it was an experience that a lot of us want to get back to and that's the aim for this year to get back into Super League. Yeah, it's a bit it's a bit different. Um, obviously, the new players coming in, but um, like you said, uh, Jad was with us for I think it was like three years. So him coming back was a big boost for us. Um, his leadership, um, just the way he plays as well. We all, we all know what what you can do on the field, and me personally, it would be great to work alongside him and with um, Chambo and Chris. That quality players that we've added all. all all around quality players they've had to the squad um, coming from great teams in the Super League. So, uh, yeah, I feel like they they just add to what we can offer and definitely could get us um, where we want to be in which is Super League. Gareth, he remains at his hometown club for this season. He's come through the youth system there as well. You can see and hear how much the club means to him. Absolutely. Um, one of the really interesting things about London this year is who's the next off that conveyor belt. You know, with Danny Ward and Jamie Langley in charge, I think because they'd worked in the junior systems and the scholarship before moving up to the first team, they fully understand and appreciate how much talented young players there are in London. Uh, and they've, they've pushed a few more up this year again, so we're going to see some, some more exciting players, I'm sure. There. Now, ahead of the season, Sadiq has suffered with a bit of an injury. How much will that affect the Broncos? It's a definite blow because he's one of the lads who, who played in Super League and he's been part of this long-existing squad. Um, I'm, I'm sure Danny Ward and Jamie Langley will have plans to cover it. Uh, I'm interested to see how Jared Samet goes going back down there. He was a huge fan's favourite. Uh, backflips after tries and, and spectacular <laughs> action on the field. So he's going to be one to watch, I think. Are we going to see any backflips after any tries from you this season, Danica? Well, if I score a try, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> now, we are talking about rugby league growing and London isn't the heartland, as they said, of rugby league. But it's good to hear that school kids and children are getting the opportunities to play it still. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, they've got a really wicked school set up, um, you know, all the way from year seven up to year 11. And that's and it's around the Broncos area as well. So it's given young children not only rugby league, it's given them a great competitive kind of platform. And it's been held, you know, at the home of the London Broncos. And therefore, it's again, you're going back to the aspirational type of thing, isn't it? it it's showing them and they've got a great great program um, with offering tickets to the local community, to getting the schools involved, to getting everybody in there, which is just going to build on the game it's going to build you know the talent in London and hopefully you know like you say build it coming through and, and have those players come all the way through and, and compete up in the championship. Gareth do you think the main aim of the club this season is to get themselves back into the Super League? I'm sure that's what they'll want I think it is a big ask just because you know they have had some losses from that squad uh, a couple of experienced players um, but I think in the media we've learned not to underestimate London Broncos and Danny Ward I think we all did it the year they went up, we probably did it the season they were in Super League and they defied the odds each time, so keep your eye on them, definitely. Now, that was the last of the championship sides on our road trip. Gareth, are there any teams that we need to mention before we move on? I think the storyline's right across the competition, isn't there? If you look at Halifax, um, they've rebranded during the off-season to Halifax Panthers, so it'll be really interesting to see how that works for them and they've made some head-turning signings as well. Uh, elsewhere, you've, you've got the, the heavy woolen rivals, Batley and Dewsbury. Uh, both have got their own reasons. You know, Dewsbury started last season flying under Lee Greenwood. Uh, Batley have made some, some interesting signings as well, so there's plenty for them to be optimistic about. Uh, on the other side of the Pennines, Martin Ridyard, great signing for Swinton, real experience at that level. Uh, and the two clubs that were the last two to be promoted through the, the usual route of Oldham and Whitehaven probably weren't that disappointed that the season got to be restarted. They'll be better prepared, I think, for it this time. So I think there's reasons for everyone to be optimistic. It's going to be a great season. Now, the penultimate stop on our Rugby League tour saw us arrive at League One, which includes plenty of ambitious teams with familiar names as well. None more so than Workington Town coach Chris Thorman, who's still got a strong Geordie accent, despite a Rugby League career which's taken him all over the world. So, Chris, uh, it's been a tough year um, for the Championship and League One clubs. How have yourself and the Workington Club worked through 2020 and 2021 uh, keeping players engaged, etc. Well, I, I suppose at the beginning of 2020, you know, no, no one could see what, what was going to happen in the world. Um, and initially, 
Um, the, you know, it was pretty easy, you know, pretty straightforward. The, the boys were just told to keep themselves ticking over. You know, we immediately kind of got them to download Strava, um, you know, our head of S and C. You know, put plenty of workouts in um, for, for, for them, essentially just to just to be prepared to to kind of react to whatever the government of the RFL um, had in place. And and if I'm honest, Adam, we we thought you know we'd be back in in a matter of a couple of months, maybe at max. But obviously, the longer it went on, and um, you know, we became we became more aware of the, the you know global circumstances. We um, I, I, I kind of changed tact, and I thought that you know what, you know, I haven't you know spent my life in professional rugby league as a player and now as a coach. There's one thing you you very you don't you don't very often get, and that's a rest. Um, so so we kind of thought, well, you know what we're going to do, we'll, we'll use that time wisely, and we'll get them to you know get flush their bodies out and get rid of any niggles and any nagging injuries, any chronic injuries and stuff like that, um, and, and we use that time. To, to do that with our medical team and our SNC team. Yeah. I've had some interesting conversations and the one thing I didn't profess to know Adam is about is about League One, you know, because I haven't spent a lot of my career in League One. So I had to do a lot of homework and I had to, you know, kind of trust the people that were already working at the club. You know, I brought a few people in, you know, people like Oliver Wiltz. You know, Ollie's been one of my mates for Christ, going on twenty odd years, you know, we we played we played at Sheffield Eagles together back in Super League days, and then you know when when Huddersfield Sheffield merged, we, we kind of you know we've been friends ever since then, and and obviously it was just coincidence that I came here as head coach, and it was Ollie's you know uh, final year just about, and he was the club captain, so Ollie's on the staff, and I, and I and I have to trust the opinions of my locally based staff, you know, Neil Fraser is a bit of a a local legend and uh, you know that's the reason I brought Gary Hewer in and it's just really important that I have constant communication with all my other staff and they, they make me aware of uh, the idiosyncrasies of uh, Cumbrians and, and stuff like that you know a majority a majority born and bred and um, I tell you what they're a bit different on the west side. <laughs> How, how's your squad shaping up for 2021 and is there any players you would pick out for, to, to keep an eye out for Workington this season? Um, this, this, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the squad, Adam. And, and I suppose if you ask any head coach, um, they're never fully satisfied. You know, you, you always want to be in the market for if good players become available, and, and we're no different. Um, you know, our criteria might be a little bit different to others. And, and if you're a good person, then then you're halfway there because you, you're willing to learn, you apply yourself. You know, you're diligent, you're um, hardworking, you. You're on time, you know all, all the all the things that you need to be good to be successful. Not in just life, not in just professional sport, but in life too. And I and I really feel like that's been important for us. Um, and 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 we're we're just about there. Now, Danica, it's really interesting to hear them say how they've used this time to reset. Any injuries that they had, he's allowed the players to to have a bit of space, a bit of time off, reset the bodies. That must be music to your ears as a player, right? Yeah, I think that has been the biggest benefit of lockdown, uh, especially for the girls um, at Leeds. We've had a couple of girls who've had shoulder um, operations who have been playing with them not at 100% strength, which obviously isn't great. And it's all those little niggles that you get that sometimes in the off-season, especially like we mentioned with the international games as well, you don't actually get that much of an off-season. So to have that time, as much as we didn't want it, we want to play, it has actually uh, reset everybody. And I'm sure um, across from Super League to Championship to League One to the women's, you know, everyone's had that bit of a breather. Everyone's had that extra rest they needed and raring to go. It's just making sure now we prepare for going into it and we don't go in too hard and, and therefore get the injuries from having nothing. So, yeah, but it's, it, it will help everybody, I'm sure. And Gareth, it must be slightly different for Chris with it being part-time. Sounds like it's taking uh, some getting used to in Cumbria. Yeah, but I think he's a really good fit for them. You know, he's spoken a lot since he's been there about not just developing the first team that he coaches, but developing the whole club, their links with community clubs, uh, the local junior game. He signed a three-year contract, so he, I don't think he was just going up there just to, to have another a rung on his coaching ladder. I think he can see the potential in the club and he wanted to help make them a better club uh, and he seems to be doing a good job of it. Now, we know how difficult the challenge has been over the past couple of years for everyone, but down in League One, Gareth, do you think it's been a little bit tougher? 
It's certainly not been easy, um, and, and I just think that that length of time between seeing your supporters again, you know, people do get out of the habit of doing things. So everybody is now, you know, can't wait for that first game when they get the fans back. You know, League One starts a little bit later, doesn't it? In May, some of them are involved in the Challenge Cup, but all those clubs will be itching just to get back in front of their fans and get them back at ground supporting their clubs. Now the big question, Gareth, who do you see pressing for promotion then from League One? Well, I think Barrow are justifiable favourites in most people's eyes. They've got a great squad. They have had a blow the last week or so with, with Sean Lunt retiring. You know, he was the kind of player that would win matches almost on his own at that level. So that's a blow, but they're going to be tough to beat. But again, I think you're going to see a whole host of clubs there. Keithley have made some really good signings. Rochdale have, Doncaster, we've seen Workington there. I think there's going to be a whole cluster of clubs and I think it's going to be another terrific competition. Now the season all starts with the Betfred Challenge Cup and we thought it was only right that we ended our tour to see how the 2020 Challenge Cup winners Leeds Rhinos were doing. So let's hear from two key figures in the Leeds Rhinos triumph at an empty Wembley Stadium last October. Head coach Richard Agar and the man who scored that late drop goal to seal victory, Leeds Rhinos Luke Gale. Looking at the, the Betfred Challenge Cup there behind you, what, what do you remember of that, that famous day at Wembley last year? Um, look, fantastic memories and memories that will last, last a lifetime. I've been looking at the trophy since being a kid. I've got pictures of it being a kid in my amateur rugby league club, Middle of Marauders. So um, I've just checked my name's actually on it now, which is uh, quite surreal, really. But um, yeah, uh, great day and uh, a real proud day, yeah. It was a great day, despite there not being a crowd at Wembley. You know, it, it certainly won't diminish uh, the fact of, of what we achieved, the accomplishment of, of winning the Challenge Cup, and some great moments that we had around that. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I think we showed enough improvements in the league. Uh, in what was a difficult season for everybody, the way that the, I guess, the fixture list got uh, um, sort of moved around and, and very congested at points. That. It was a season that posed different challenges to what any normal season would have. So, you know, touch wood for all concerned, it heads in the right direction this year, and we have a little bit less, um, bit less impact from from the virus, if you like, uh, and then we can get you know a, a full compelling season out. And it's one that we're looking forward to. We understand that we took some steps in the right direction last year, but but we're very much about you know being a consistent team. Uh, and improving on, on what we did in 2020. It's got to go in, one, to, one towards the sticks, one towards the sticks. Now it comes, Gale, Luke Gale with a drop goal, and he peels away in celebration of the moment because he knew the moment it left the boot, it was going over. Thumbs up for Gale. What did it mean to you to kick that winning drop goal? Uh, look, it was um, it was quite a strange game. We we. We had the ascendancy, and then we thought we threw it away. Salford come back real well, and and it was it was tighter than anticipated at the end. And I'm just glad to see it go over. Uh, but it won it, that quite early on. I think there's still eight minutes left yet, so we had a, a bit of work to do. And as I say, Salford, I thought Salford played real well, especially that second half. Uh, but we got over the line, and uh, yeah, that can never be taken away from us. This has been an unforgettable year. And here is an unforgettable moment for this group of Leeds players. And obviously there were no fans there last year. Um, with the chance to, to defend the trophy, they get back to Wembley and do it in front of fans. Is that something that drives the squad on this year? Yeah, 100%. We actually had a conversation with a few boys and just saying, look, we'll have to kind of do it again, but this time with fans and, and with families there. So, yeah, look, I'm sure the boys will go extra hard this year. Um, I know there's, there's a round coming up and... Um, Everyone's massively excited. The season's just about to start, so um, yeah, it it looks even better with the the, the blue and amber on on the side. So hopefully we can keep that another year. Oh, for sure, we'd love to back it up. You know, we as I said, we thoroughly enjoyed the whole journey and experience. Albeit it, it was slightly different to what it normally is. Uh, if there's one thing that I could change, it would be for the players to sort of enjoy that that lap of honour and, and walking out to the roar of the crowd and, and the bus journey home where uh, it gives our chance, uh, our fans chance to, you know, to celebrate the team's achievements. But hopefully we'll get to that at some point fairly early in the season and, and we'd love to be able to, to back that up. But at the same time, you know, we want to we wanna go a little bit further than, than we did, uh, you know, in the Super League competition as well. And finally, what can fans expect from your, your new side, three new recruits for, for this club this year? Yeah, well, 
we feel that the, the DNA of our club demands that we play a good brand of football, so that's what we're aiming to do. You know, we've, we felt that at periods last year, we played some really exciting stuff. I thought we started the season particularly well in that, so uh, we feel it's, it's imperative for us that, that we're a team that um, you know, tries its utmost to play uh, you know, a good brand of rugby league. Of course, you know, the teams that generally finish uh, in the top two teams usually have the best defensive record, so some areas of improvement for that, for us. Uh, but again, we'd love to sort of carry on the traditions of the successful teams that's been at the Rhinos in the past and, and be a team that, you know, really enjoys playing rugby. Danica, I've got to come straight to you off the back of this one. How big was that Challenge Cup win for Leeds Rhinos as a club? Oh, well, it, it sealed the, uh, the Challenge Cup trophy cabinet, didn't it? Uh, with all three, three clubs under Leeds having it. Uh, but it was great for Leeds, you know, a very inconsistent season, you know, with COVID with them and, and their results. Um, and to get to the Challenge Cup final and to to win in such a weird condition as well, isn't it? You know, not having... Imagine going to Wembley, not having any fans there. Um, especially, I think, Leeds as a team, they definitely thrive off that. I mean, everybody thrives off the spectators, but, uh, you know, Leeds particularly. So, uh, yeah, it was great for them to get there, great for the win, you know, and especially to see, like, Luke Gale back and in the swing of it and, and being so, you know, s such a big part of that, that team and and carrying that consistency forward with his captaincy, with the way he plays. He leads by example a lot of the time. So, um, yeah, really great. And uh, I'm glad the men can finally join with the women's in the wheelchair and, and get that trophy. Gareth, hopefully that was the final uh, first and last Challenge Cup final without any fans. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm in a privileged job generally, but that afternoon when there was only a relative handful of people in Wembley was especially privileged. Um, but it's not quite the same you know, without supporters. Uh, it, it was such a credit to the players out there that they produced such a fantastic match you know, that went right down to the wire. Um, the intensity and, and quality of the game was absolutely brilliant. Uh, it would have been great if the fans were there. They weren't this time, but as you say, let's hope that's the, a one-off. And it's made me so excited to get the Challenge Cup underway next week. It is an exciting time for rugby league. We are getting closer and closer to it. Just watching that, seeing the reaction, watching some of the clips as well. Don't know about you, it's got me ready for it. Yeah, it just means it's hair, isn't it? Like next weekend we start rugby league again. We've had the pre-seasons, we've had a few friendlies, but it, what you say, it's back, you know. We are back on track to hopefully, fingers crossed, um, a great Challenge Cup run, a great season and uh, rugby league being back with spectators in the near future. So I can't wait. I can't wait as well. So there we have it. The season launch is done and dusted. And now the countdown is on until we hear that first klaxon when Sheffield Eagles take on York City Knights on Friday, March the 19th. Stay safe. And from everyone here at the Rugby Football League, we cannot wait to see you back in the stadium soon. A unique twist to Rugby League's big day, the fireworks go off. There's no roar in the background, but there'll be plenty of roar on the pitch. Leaning quickly out there, they've got numbers around, gets it away. And it's going to be another cup final try for Tom Briscoe. Ball bounces end over end in the air, but that's superbly taken by Colin Watkins and Evans is involved. And here comes Reese Williams, and Williams is away. He's going to take some stopping, and Reese Williams with a try from nothing. Gale now, Gale puts the ball away, Williams tries to come in and stop it. It's all about the kick here, and has he got it? No, he's not. So it remains at 16 points apiece. Now it comes, Gale. Look, Gale with a drop goal, and he peels away in celebration of the moment because he knew the moment it left the boot, it was going over. Thumbs up for Gale. Hooter sounds before they do, and Leeds gather round in jubilation. Salford sink to their knees. But what a cup final we've seen here today. What a great game of rugby league that was. This has been...